Must remember this A kiss is just a kiss A sigh is just a sigh The fundamental things apply As time goes by And when two lovers woo They still say I love you On that you can rely No matter what the future brings As time goes by In 1940, I want to go back to that year. It was the summer of that year, matter of fact. In Concenzio, he goes to visit this family. Now the father, he knows why Concenzio is there because he wants to see his daughter, Lucy. He wants nothing to do with Concenzio. He looks at him and said, so why are you coming here? He said, I've come to see your daughter. He said, look at you, D'Angelo. You're nobody. You're nothing. What are you doing here? You leave. Go. Oh, and by the way, I've got an axe. So he does find a way to see Lucy. And he said, um, I'm, going to the, I'm going to America. She said, OK. She's going to flip about it. She didn't care. Or so she said. And he said, well, don't get married. I'm coming back. And she's like, oh, oh look at you. What a big talker you are. You're leaving and you're coming back to marry me, sure. So Lucy is thinking he's either crazed or he's serious. She couldn't make up her mind. Well, on May 8th, the war's over. What does Concenzio do? Well, he wants to go home. Who does he ask to go home? His commanding colonel. He said, can I get a pass to go to Toco de Casario? He said, of course you can. Because everybody at the headquarters company, the clerks and everybody, have heard him talking nonstop from the time he got into the unit until this day about Lucy. And they're thinking, oh my lord, one day he'll marry this woman and get over this. So the colonel sends him on his way with a pass and said, don't be in a rush to come back, but come back when you're supposed to. So, he's near Ancona, which is under Rimini. Because remember, they're at Bologna and they're kind of spread everywhere, and so he's kind of fluffing off because really there's nothing to do. So, he winds up catching a ride at Milano in a P-38, Lockheed Lightning. Now, Concenzio stood about this tall to me. And he was a small guy, especially when he was young and it was the war. So behind the uh, pilot seat in a P-38, there's the radio equipment area, but there's enough for one person to get back there if they really tried, and they were small enough. So he gets back there in the P-38, they take off, they're flying to Foggia, which, you know, is northern Italy, it's heading the right direction. This is great. During the war, Foggia was the uh, home base for the 15th uh, Air Force, but specifically the 31st uh, Fighter Group. The 31st flew P-51s, escorted um, B-24s and B-17s to Palesti, etc. So, I mean, this, this was a, a very important hub from Italy during the war for our aviators. And there are a lot of amazing fighter pilots who served there. Uh, one person in particular was uh, Lieutenant Colonel, not at the time, but uh, would retire as Lieutenant Colonel Robert J. Goebel whose cousins were also in the German Army and Air Force. Don't ask how that happened. His uh, grandparents came over from Germany, and, um, well, his other relatives stayed. So the 31st had a great combat record. He's there in Foggia, and he decides, OK, I can't make it. It's too late, so I'm going to stay in Foggia for the night. So the next morning, he catches a ride with a colonel driving a Jeep. Now, this was unusual for a corporal, because he's thinking, oh, wait a minute. Usually, the people who are driving Jeeps are privates, corporals, sergeants, and that's about it. No officer should ever be driving a Jeep, so he's kind of freaking out by this. So this colonel pulls over and picks him up. 
and he starts talking to Concenzio in Italian. So they're starting their conversation, and he said, well, isn't it great the war's over? And Concenzio's like, oh, this is great. I'm excited. And so he said, well, you know, it's amazing that, you know, our two sides got together before the end of the war. And he looks at him and said, Colonel, what do you mean our two sides got together? He said, don't you see my, you know, my corporal stripes, and don't you see the fact I'm in the 34th Infantry Division? I'm an American. He's like, oh, I thought they just gave you that uniform because you didn't have anything else. He's like, no. He said, you know, I went through basic at, you know, Camp Blanding, or Fort, no, Fort Benning, sorry. And he's looking at him like, oh. So the colonel felt really stupid by this point. So they stopped talking for a few minutes because it kind of looked uncomfortable. So finally they pick up the conversation again. Still talking in Italian, goofing off. And so he drops him off, that's right, he drops Kunji off near Ancona. So at this point he's thinking, how am I going to get back to Tocco de Casario? Because I don't have a ride right now. Lo and behold, one of his buddies, true story, is driving a deuce and a half, and he's an Italian kid from Toco, so it's kind of funny. So he's driving a deuce and a half, and he says, Congenzio, what are you doing here? He's like, well, the same thing you're doing here. Going back to Toco. He said, yeah, let's go. So they take the truck, go to Toco. Now, this is where my cousin, it's hilarious, because he said, you know, I'm in my Class A uniform, everybody in town's coming out, and everybody's throwing this big party. He said, you know, he said, I hate to admit it, but... I kind of felt like a big shot. It was almost like being Mussolini. He said, we know, when he came to a town, he said everybody would pour out all the, you know, all the you know, wine, all the food, and everything else. And he said, oh, and by the way, you know, everybody would be throwing confetti everywhere. And you know, El Duce was in town. He said, but no, I felt just like El Duce. So I didn't say that, but I, it was like that. <laughs> so then, one of our cousins comes to him. Her name is Camilla. And she said, hey, Congenzio, Lucietta's still in town. He said, oh, I'll get to her tomorrow. <laughs> so the girl he's been dreaming about since 1940, he'll get to her tomorrow. It's kind of cocky. So uh, Concenzio sits back, enjoying the wine, enjoying the food, enjoying seeing his friends and family. And the next day, he goes over to see Lucy. So who should see him but Niccolo? Lucy's father, and he says, Concenzio, look at you. He's thinking, look at me? And he said, look at you, you're wearing an American uniform. You're a good young man. And he's thinking, pardon my language, he's, this is what he said, he's like, now you son of a bitch, now I'm a good guy because I'm wearing an American uniform. Italy's in a mess, and you want me to take Lucy the hell out of here. <laughs> now you want me to marry your daughter. He doesn't say that to him, but he's thinking it. Probably something I would have thought too. So he asks him in Italian, Che fatta la chatta? Which means, where's your axe? And he said, Concenzio, you're such a good boy. He said, no, 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 that was back when you were young. You were too young to get married. He said, look at you now. He said, you've made something of yourself. He's thinking, yeah, okay. So I want to see your daughter. So uh, he sees Lucy. He proposes to her, and um, she accepts. So now, what does he got to do? It's like, okay, I'm getting married, so this means I've got to report back to my base. I've got to fill out the proper pa appropriate paperwork to get her stateside to my mom, and then when I get back home, marry her. So he goes back to his colonel. There, I think they're near Bologna, somewhere around there. Actually, near Milan. Sorry. And so at that time, his colonel says, "Okay, take your time. Go get Lucy squared away." They're all excited because they're thinking, "Finally, he's going to marry this girl." It took forever. So he goes to Laverna, which is a point of disembarkation for Italy, for, for northern Italy. This is where you go out of, out of the country. So he has to get a Red Cross ship. She has to take tuberculosis tests. She has to take a whole bunch of other tests, blood tests. And she has to have a whole bunch of x-rays. So all that's lined up. She's done all that. Everything's going well. She's a war bride. So who's at Laverno at the point of disembarkation? <laughs> but Lieutenant Smith, now Sergeant Smith. 
He was given a battlefield commission during the war, and after the combat was over, he was brought back down to his three rockers up, three rockers down, Master Sergeant. So, Smitty, as he was called by all of his friends, including Kunji, he says, Smitty, what are you doing here? Smitty looks at him and said, D'Angelo, what the hell are you doing here? He said, aha, I know, you finally married Lucy, or getting married to her. He said, well, yeah. He said, you don't have enough points to go back, D'Angelo, so what the hell are you doing? He said, well, I'm trying to get Lucy to the States. He said, all right, just give me a few minutes. So he goes in the back office, makes a few phone calls. So he comes out to Kunji and he said, D'Angelo, you're going home. He said, Smitty, how the hell did you do that? He said, I took care of it. You're going home with your wife. Just go home. Enjoy the rest of your life. It's my wedding gift. So a couple weeks, they wind up going on a Red Cross ship from Laverno back to the United States. They were married, if I remember correctly. Let's see, I know I've got it. It's going to drive me crazy. That's why I should always tab things. Ah. So they get to the United States in 45. They plan for their wedding. They got married on August 16th, August 17th, 1946. And they were married for 66 years until Lucy died in March of 2013. And Kunji died in November of 2013. They were inseparable. You know, the thing about this story, it's a love story in the middle of the war. And I called it sort of a homecoming because, well, it was sort of a homecoming, but not really. Right, Concenzio came back and northern Italy, part of it was okay, but other places were just blown to hell and back. Rome wasn't bad, but the countryside, the factories, the bridges, everything was a mess. And when he left, Toko in 1940, that maybe, just maybe, somehow, everything would work out. And what's interesting about the journey is, if you think about this, think about the first person who ever decided to leave where they were, grew up. I don't, we don't know who that person is. That person's lost to history. But they were the first person to say, I wonder if on the other side of that hill the pastures are greener. His story is among millions and billions of stories that are out there that are rarely ever told. And yes, he was an immigrant, but he became an American. Lucy became an American. And this one side of my family that were so, such immigrants, were all Americans. Because he put one foot in front of the other and took a journey. It took him five years, but he waited patiently for the girl he wanted to marry. He saw the horror of war. He acted as the headquarters company interpreter, because why? <laughs> One of my friends, or our friends, family friends, Marcy Marcinella, he was the guy when I was a kid who cut my hair. Well, he was in the 34th Infantry Division with who else? Gunji. Everybody was in the 34th Infantry Division in our small town. And of course, they were all Italian. And I knew all of them. So I couldn't get away with anything as a child, trust me. Because <laughs> everybody would tell somebody. And it would get back to my grandparents and get back to my mom and dad. So you didn't want to do anything. He didn't have his lucky because his translating skills from English to Italian or Italian to English weren't as good as Kunji's. Kunji kind of was spared a little bit. I mean, he was under fire, he never really talked about it, but um, I thought the love story was a little bit more interesting. Now, there are other things that are interesting too. Here we go. The Red Bull's claims to fame. First Americans to deploy in Europe in World War II, January 26, 1942. First US, U.S. attack against German forces in the war. Longest combat tour in Europe. Some units served 11, 611 days in combat. Most casualties per capita in World War II. 
Most defended hills taken in World War II. That's a pretty good combat record. First sleeve insignia for the 34th Infantry Division. The first one is an Italian-made insignia. That's pretty scarce. The second one is an English-made insignia because they went to England first. They trained in Scotland and Northern Ireland. And then, you know, some of them became Darby's Rangers. As a matter of fact, the last Darby's Ranger died two days ago. This is also an English-made patch. And the last one is the standard American-made patch. So, I will pass these around. Then, I will show you something you barely ever see. This is a jacket for an Italian captain. It's the real thing. It's kind of not in perfect shape, but go find these somewhere. It's not that easy. This one, there is a captain in the 34th who always watched out for Kunji. Now, you see the 88th Division patch and then the 34th. Well, the 34th was the combat unit. The 88th, this is what happened to Kunji too. When you didn't have enough points to rotate out, you wound up going to the 88th to serve occupation duty in Italy, and then you left with the 88th. Now this one is really rare, first sleeve insignia for the 34th Infantry Division. The first one is an Italian-made insignia. That's pretty scarce. The second one is an English-made insignia because they went to England first. They trained in Scotland and Northern Ireland. And then, you know, some of them became Darby's Rangers. As a matter of fact, the last Darby's Ranger died two days ago. This is also an English-made patch. And the last one is the standard American-made patch. So, I will pass these around. Then, I will show you something you barely ever see. This is a jacket for an Italian captain. It's the real thing. It's kind of not in perfect shape, but go find these somewhere. It's not that easy. This one, there's a captain in the 34th who always watched out for Kunji. Now, you see the 88th Division patch and then the 34th. Well, the 34th was the combat unit. The 88th, this is what happened to Kunji too. When you didn't have enough points to rotate out, you wound up going to the 88th to serve occupation duty in Italy, and then you left with the 88th. Now this one is really rare, more of the France D-Day, but it's a 5th Ranger Battalion M41 jacket. So these were the early jackets they had, then they went to the M43s, like this one. That is something you very rarely see outside of a museum. That's one of my prized pieces in my collection. Now. M1 helmet, and that's actually an original wartime helmet. Everything is original. There was a doctor I met. He was one of the Hopkins, this is from Johns Hopkins. He was actually attached to Merle's Marauders. He said this design was the worst helmet known to man from a medical perspective. He said it didn't protect your ears or the nape of your neck. And it wasn't as heavy as the German helmets. Now, for convenience, it had a two-part, you know, this two-piece had the interpressurized liner. You could take that out, and you can shave in here, you could wash in here, and even cook in here. And guys did it. So, it was a useful thing, but it didn't really offer you much protection. So, in 1983, we adopted the Kevlar helmet, which looks an awful lot like the M35 Wehrmacht helmet. And the reason why the, the Kevlar helmet didn't come into acceptance until 1983 was because the World War II veterans who were still in the service sure as hell didn't want to see American troops wearing a German-style helmet. True story. Now this is an M1939 Italian helmet. 
with the camo cover on it, and the one piece head, the one piece helmet liner, which is like the German helmet liner that were in the M35, M40, and M44 helmets. I'm in 42, sorry. So yes, my wife thinks I'm crazy. I have too much of a collection, <laughs> and if you all want to see this relic, feel free. Nothing would be complete without pictures. But I'm going to flip to some pictures at the very end of this slide. There's Kunji with two Italian officers <laughs> in Italy. Where else would they be? Where else would he be? And then there's a picture to the right. He's with a little boy. That's my son when he was four years old. And then there's a picture of the four of us, me and my son Alex, and Lucy and Kunji. And notice there's a Jeep behind them, which is ironic because the very first picture you see in this is Kunji sitting on top of the hood of his Jeep. <laughs> so there you have it. He was a good man. I was really fortunate enough to know him. And he put up with me. Now, I will give you one piece of advice Kunji gave me as an Italian. He said, Eduardo, if you ever pay more than $15 for a bottle of wine, I'm going to kick your ass. He said, good wine shouldn't cost that much money. I'm like, okay. Now my grandfather made his own wine, so you go figure. Now, that is the end of the story. It's a great love story, and it's not just a war story. So I hope you enjoyed it.